All right, so uh, welcome to part two. Uh, again, I'm talking about multidimensional and nonlinear mechanism design. Uh, today, um, the, the main goal is to focus on solving the single agent problems. However, uh, I did not finish uh, one of my agenda items from yesterday, so I'm going to start by finishing that agenda item. Um, to remind you, uh, we were looking at multi to single agent reductions. And we had given a reduction under an assumption of revenue linearity, which was basically saying, uh, if you want to think about uh, a, 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 an auction given an allocation rule, which is a complicated function governing the probability that uh, types are served as a function of how strong they are, that auction will always look like a convex combination of very simple mechanisms that are the optimal mechanisms if you're just going to uh, consider an ex ante constraint on the probability of, of, of service. So in other words, these complicated mechanisms look like convex combinations of very simple mechanisms. And so their revenue is going to be the convex combination of the revenue of the simple mechanisms. And that's exactly what revenue linearity is saying. It's the revenue is a convex combination of revenue of things that come from convex combinations. Okay, um, so the focus of today is going to be looking at uh, how to solve uh, mechanism design problems, reducing the multiplayer problem to single player problems when you don't have this nice revenue linearity property. Okay, meaning if I give you some uh, allocation rule and you want to find the optimal mechanism for that, it will not look like uh, the uh, a convex combination of simple mechanisms that come from these uh, ex ante pricing problems. Okay? Um, so, this single agent problem, as I said, it will have a constraint on the entire allocation rule. Uh, to build multiplayer mechanisms from single player mechanisms, we're going to look at uh, a method of stochastic weight optimization and see how that allows us to resolve the. Uh, the the multiplayer problem. Um, there'll be no assumptions, and uh, uh, so it'll ha handle general non uh, multi dimensional preferences and also general risk aversion or budgets. Question? Yeah. So, on the, on the easy setting, is what's fundamental revenue linearity or more the order or ability property, do you think? Um, so, revenue linearity implies order ability. Uh, yeah. Revenue linearity implies orderability. Okay. And the converse is not true, but sort of in a pathological way, so I wouldn't worry about it so much. So I don't think that distinction is very interesting. I would think of them as the same. Um, I want to clear up some questions that I got last time from people um, after the talk to get us all on the same page. Okay, so one question is, how do you prove revenue linearity? I have a setting, I'm wondering if it's revenue linear, how do I prove it? And I'll give you two answers. One answer is if there's a payment identity, meaning I can tell you the revenue of any uh, mechanism just by looking at its allocation rule. Okay? Then it's revenue linear, it has to be because one way to construct the mechanism that allocation will take complex combinations of other mechanisms. And so the only way to do it is the way that has that same revenue. Right, but Jason, um, in one good auction case, the payment identity is easy. In these other cases, I mean, my guess is... This is A. I have B. <laughs> on A, it might, take, it might take some work to establish, in, like in a multi-attribute, multi-good thing. If you have an identity, you end up doing lots of work to prove it, I, I would suspect. That's, that's correct. And in the single uh, player uh, question, um, the so that's correct. And so which is why I'm going to give you another way to prove revenue linearity. And, uh, and I, I, before doing that, though, I want to point out single dimensional pr linear preferences have a payment identity. We know that. Um, multi dimensional preferences do not have a payment identity. And even the cases that were revenue linear don't have a payment identity. So I just want to draw you a picture to remind you. Um, we saw, uh, let's see, this mechanism, which sold with probability one half. And so it has an allocation rule that looks like this. 
Right, and this was, uh, what was it? I forget what this was. Oh, yeah, square root of one half. Good, thanks. Um, so this was the allocation rule, y of q, and this was the allocation in type space where this is t1 and this is t2, and you get item 1 here and item 2 here. Okay? We saw another mechanism that had allocation rule, the same allocation rule, and that was, for instance, just sell item 1. Right? And that has the exact same allocation rule. Right? If you do this, you get a revenue of square root one half, which is bigger than if you do this, which is a revenue of one half. Same allocation rule, different revenues. No payment identity. Four, when I write things in terms of these allocation rules. Okay. Um, the other approach is the existence of virtual values. Okay, so what are virtual values? I'm going to get to this much more uh, in the later part of the talk um, today. Just, this might be a little bit basic, but it's, it's the reason that you don't have a payment identity for multidimensional types, basically because you're squashing the, squashing the dimensions down to one dimension for your allocation rule? So you're sort of losing yes. the allocation. Yes, yes. And you could define a payment identity in terms of these pictures, and then they do have one. If I give you a picture here, and I tell you another mechanism has the same picture here in terms of who wins, it has the same revenue. Okay, so in terms of these pictures, they have the same revenue, but for composing multiplayer uh, mechanisms from single player mechanisms, this is what I care about. Okay, this stuff doesn't really matter so much, and I need to pay my identity here in order to get, have this, this, uh, this build up. Okay, so why do virtual values tell me that it's revenue linear? So remember, uh, and we'll get into this in more detail, for those of you who know what virtual values are, uh, virtual values let me write revenue as the uh, uh, expectation of a virtual value times the probability of service, which is fundamentally a linear, it's linear. Right? So having written things as a virtual value, I've just written down that the revenue must be linear. Okay. Um, and so we'll talk about more of that later when we uh, develop virtual values for this setting, whereby we'll be able to con confirm that this is revenue linear. Okay, good. So I have another great question about the awful mechanism for the uniform 0, 1 squared, which I talked about, which was basically you always sell the guy's favorite item, and it essentially looks like uniform prices like this. So basically this, or comments combinations of these, are what optimal mechanisms look like. Okay, another great question which was, well this just looks like you're collapsing the multidimensional type space into a single dimension, which is the agent's value for his favorite object. And the answer is yes. And in fact, for the uniform 0, 1 squared case, this is optimal. It's optimal to collapse types to a single dimensional type. It is not generally optimal to do that. And so the task is to understand when it's generally optimal to collapse the type space to a single dimensional type. Okay, and that's, again, what's going to happen later today. Okay, yes, that's what we did, or what will have to have happened, and we'll prove it today. Okay, um, the... The, before I go into this more complex reduction uh, to get multiplayer mechanisms from single player mechanisms, I want to talk, I'm, I, I, it's going to be complicated, and you're going to wish we didn't live in that world, okay? And so I want to tell you that you can approximately not live in that world. In other words, if you're happy to give up a little bit of the optimal revenue, you can stay in the, re you can basically pretend it was revenue linear, and use the marginal revenue mechanism we, we talked about the other day, and things will be okay. Okay, so I want to tell you how to get approximate um, ex ante reduction without revenue linearity. And so here's the idea. A marginal revenue-based mechanism is one that always looks to every agent like it's a convex combination of the ex ante optimal mechanisms. 
Okay, so you're not doing funnier things than just convex combining these mechanisms. So even though it would be optimal to do something better for some allocation rule, I'm just going to do the simple thing and take the convex combination of them. Okay, and the challenge in understanding how well a, a marginal revenue mechanism does compared to the optimal mechanism is that the optimal one is not marginal revenue based. It does some complicated thing that's not doing marginal revenue. So here's the idea. Let's relax the ex post feasibility constraint. So think of this as we had one item to sell. Let's relax the fact that we have one item to sell to sell one item in expectation. Okay, so relax ex post feasibility to hold ex ante or an expectation. Okay? If you do that, then the constraint that one agent poses on the other agents is well, if he gets it with some ex ante probability, that means you can't give to the other agent with that ex ante probability. So that poses an ex ante constraint on the other agent, not an interim constraint. Okay? So the the optimal solution to the ex ante relaxation is actually marginal revenue based. It's going to be only using ex ante pricings in its solution. Every single dimensional linear agent mechanism is marginal revenue based, and that follows because of the payment identity. Because every mechanism's revenue comes from the payment identity, they're all marginal revenue based. Okay? What does that mean? That means any approximation result that you prove for single dimensional agents against the ex ante upper bound, the ex ante relaxation, will automatically extend to general agents using the, 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 uh, the marginal revenue based approach. <coughs> okay? And it's just if you use the building block of single dimensional agents, and you prove a theorem where the upper bound also uses the building blocks of single dimensional agents, then everything just comes for free. Okay, so let's suppose you wanted approximations to get arbitrarily close to optimal. If you had a large number of items, like k items, then the ex ante feasibility constraint is very, very close to the ex post feasibility constraint, um, and your approximation factor goes to one. Okay, that's one answer to your question. I don't have a better understanding of, uh, of what, this, um, what this benchmark, the ex ante relaxation, means, whether it has an economic interpretation. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's one of those things that would be sort of vacuous in large markets. Like it would always be true in large markets because a lot of large numbers holds like the agent preferences don't matter because they are coming from a continuum now. And so it would just be true. Okay, so for instance, the posted pricing or anonymous pricing approximation results that are proven for single dimensional settings automatically extend to these settings. And these were two of the things I, I nailed out for you in the first slide of the first talk, saying these are the examples of where we get approximation. Okay, so I now want to talk about uh, what I call the interim reduction or the reduction without revenue linearity. Okay, and um, this reduction uh, comes from a joint paper with Sayyidalai, Hufu, uh, Nima, uh, and Azarash. And uh, Sayyid, as I said before, is around. Hufu is going to be here for the semester also, and Nima is also here for the semester. So if you think this stuff is important and you want to learn more about it, you can talk to any of these guys. You're going to be here all, all term. Okay, it's very closely related to um, some recent work by Kai Daskalakis and Weinberg. Um, and it builds upon a lot of the classical auction theory, uh, especially the auction theory for nonlinear preferences like budgets or risk aversion. Okay, and remember my working example for the, this interim reduction was the case of a public budget. There was a reason for that because that's what the, um, these original works were talking about. Okay, and one of the interesting things about 
um, what we did in this paper, he said that the stuff that they're, this, these tools are using to solve the nonlinear case can also solve multidimensional cases using this framework of, of the multiplayer single player reduction. Okay, so what's my approach? So <clears throat> I'm going to call a profile of interim allocation constraints y hat, where this is really just n functions, one for each player, which is the allocation constraint for that player. I'm going to call that profile interim feasible if there exists some ex post allocation rule, which I'm going to denote y hat ep, which is actually a function from quantile profiles, so the, all the types of the players, to a feasible outcome. And so x is just some subset of all outcomes that's feasible. This can be anything you want. Okay. I want you to think for this talk of uh, single item settings. So this is anything that sums to at most one. Okay, just think single item settings when you think feasible here. So at this point, you have an enclosed set of compatibility? Nope. Okay, just, just trying to... And in fact, interim feasibility will not consider incentive compatibility at all. The next slide will make it really clear what I'm talking about. Okay, great question. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, this, this ex post allocation rule induces uh, these interim allocation profiles, it means I can get each profile by taking the expectation of the allocation rule for a quantile profile drawn from the distribution of quantiles, which is always IID uniform 0, 1. Okay? So I just calculate this, I get allocation rules. This is what it means to be interim feasible. Okay? Here's the theorem. The optimal revenue is given by the following program. I maximize over all allocation constraints, profiles of allocation constraints, so one for each player, the optimal revenue I can get from that allocation constraint. Remember, rev is a revenue operator. It takes this constraint and gives you the best revenue of every single player mechanism with that constraint, subject to this profile y hat being interim feasible, meaning there exists some other mechanism that doesn't have to be incentive compatible but is feasible. Okay? So I'd like to understand what optimizing this program means. Well, first, I want to get proof that it's optimal, that this theorem is correct, okay? So I'm going to give you an intuition for the proof, okay? And then I want to understand what this whole approach is going to mean. Take the background assumptions before you explain the newest proof sketch. I mean, what, what you're basically saying in this theorem is it's okay to throw away capacity. And so this some kind of monotonicity and free disposal things are running around. There's, there's something about the objective function and the, so is it just for auctions? I mean, I mean what's, what's, what class of economic environments is this theorem for? Um, I'm in the settings that were examples of which were given last time. So I've got independent private values. Okay, so independence is going to be important here. Um, and I'm. That's basically it. So think independent private value auction settings. Don't think necessarily. Quasi linear, don't think single dimensional, could be general. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you, give you a, a, the approach for this theorem from which any of you could just complete the dots and, and finish the theorem. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to then tell you how to understand this constraint, which is kind of a strange constraint because it has a, a for all in it, for all, I mean, it exists a mechanism uh, quantified there. Um, I'm then going to tell you how you can restrict attention to a small class of ex post mechanisms, which is all you have to look at, and they're not kind of simple. And so that's a sort of a nice characterization of what these things might look like. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about optimization subject to interim feasibility. Okay, so why is this um, program correct? So 
First off, this program obviously upper bounds revenue. Why? Well, any optimal mechanism has to produce allocation rules that are interim feasible. And also, for those allocation rules, it's doing, the, it's doing this already. Like, these are just the mechanism it's producing, right? So the optimal mechanism is a valid solution to this program. OK, good. So I want to show the opposite, that, that the optimal mechanism is achieved by this program. And notice there's a disconnection between mechanisms that do this and mechanisms that do this, right? Because this is what I wanted to solve independently for each player. And this is sort of any ex post feasible thing that had no incentive constraints at all. And so here's the theorem. For any ex post feasible, but not necessarily incentive compatible allocation rule, so this y hat xp, and any profile of incentive compatible, but not necessarily ex post feasible mechanisms y, if the ex post mechanism induces a profile of constraints y hat, and each yi is feasible for the yi hat, okay? Then you can come up with a combined mechanism which has the feasibility of the ex post mechanism and the incentive properties of the interim mechanisms. Okay. And the main difficulty here is y might not be equal to y hat. Why i might not be equal to y i hat? That's the main difficulty. And if you recall, uh, how I defined the interim pricing problem before. I said you need to come up with some sigma to which you can map quantiles to put into y hat to get y. Okay? And by that definition of the pricing problem, it's exactly, oh, you have some oracle for y hat. How do I turn an oracle for y hat into a mechanism that actually allocates to my agent with allocation rule y? And that's what a solution to the single agent problem was doing by that definition. Okay, so basically by that definition, it follows. Which is saying that the definition of interim uh, pricings that I gave before was the right definition of interim pricings. Okay, so um, I want to turn to my next objective. Again, here was my outline. I want to understand interim feasibility. I want to characterize ex post feasible mechanisms and optimize subject interim feasibility. So I want to turn to my next objective, which is understanding interim feasible allocation profile. So I want you to think you have a single item for sale. Okay, so ex post, you better not allocate more than one item. And I want you to think about these two profile uh, interim allocation rules. One, always allocates to the player with probably one half. Two, the top one half measure of quantiles it allocates with certainty, and the bottom one half measure of quantiles, it doesn't allocate at all. Okay, so these both have ex ante allocation probability one half. So my question for you is which of these three profiles of interim allocations for a two player, one item setting are interim feasible? For which of these do there exist an ex post mechanism that induces these allocation rules? A and B. Good. So um, A is just a lottery, right? I flip a coin, give it to one, give it to two. That exactly has these allocation rules for both players. Good. B is just a, a dictator mechanism or a, a, a right to, uh, 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 you know, I offer player one a price of that he buys to probably one half. If he said no, give it to player two. Player one buys it probably a half, so player two gets it with probably one half, which is this allocation rule. C, I'll call a double dictator, because I'm giving both the people the right to buy the thing if they're in the high half quantiles. But this can't be feasible, because what if they both say yes? I only have one item. I'm in trouble. Okay? And here's the main idea for C. What is the probability that one of the guys is high. 
What's one minus the probability that neither are high? Neither are high with probability one half squared, which is a quarter. So one is high with probability three quarters. What is the expected probability that I need to allocate to a high type if both players have this allocation rule? OK. Well, what's the probability that I allocate to a high type with player one? It's one half. Right? Well, it's the same for the other guy. Linear expectation says it's one. So the expected number of items I have to allocate to high types is one. But the, the chance that I have a high guy showing up is only three quarters. How could I possibly allocate more items than the guys show, more frequently than the guys show up? So that's a violation of interim feasibility. OK, so I now want to look at symmetric cases. So the cases where the players are IID from some distribution, they could have complicated budgets or risk aversion. I just want to look at symmetric cases and understand interim feasibility in symmetric cases. OK, so let's, how is our example, though, the one we've been talking about last time, which is two agents, IID from the distribution, and common budget F. OK, and here's a fact I want to use. If I'm trying to optimize some symmetric uh, convex program, which the program I'm trying to optimize was, then there's always a symmetric optimal solution. So I can re restrict my attention only to symmetric solutions that are interim feasible. And that's going to make my life really easy. Okay, and one of the reasons why I want to focus on this, because if you look in the literature in the 80s and 90s in, auction, in economic auction theory, you'll find a lot of solutions to nonlinear cases that take strong advantage of the symmetry assumption and basically using this property that I'm going to describe right here. Okay, so here's the lemma. The ex post mechanism I need to think about, there's only one. It is the highest quantile wins mechanism. So in other words, I take a profile of quantiles, and I uh, serve the player, the one that has the strongest quantile, which is actually the lowest quantile, because quantiles go strong as low, weak as high. Okay? So the uh, strongest quantile wins is the optimal ex post feasible allocation um, constraint for my program. Okay? It's obviously interim feasible. It's interim feasible because it's, I've defined it with an ex post mechanism. So there's, it induces some allocation rule. Good. So I'm going to prove this. So what am I saying? I'm saying there are no other symmetric allocation rules that are interim feasible that are better than this allocation rule in terms of revenue. And to do that, Jason, no, I'm just sorry, I'm a little confused or something. The, 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 the defining quantile optical mechanism and, or the allocation rule, right? You look at the allocation rule, and, and so now who the strongest quantile is depends on the allocation rule. So, so you're, when you say the strongest quantile wins, you mean the strongest quantile wins with respect to allocation rule A is optimal. Or, or, yeah, so I want to I wanna remind you that once I've done this, I'm just going to talk in terms of quantiles from the distribution to talk about feasibility. So I no longer have types. Later, I'm going to have to, the single player problem has to actually turn types into quantiles for me. Okay. But when you talk about the strongest quantile, you mean first fix this, I mean, you fix some ordering of quantiles at some point somewhere. So quantiles are defined to be ordered, where the lowest one is strongest and the, like, zero is strongest, one is weakest. Before we decide how we order the quantiles. When I have a mechanism for types, I can now tell you what the quantile of type is based on the ordering that that mechanism induces on types. I mean, I'm lost. It's strongest quantile wins. I have this nagging, I mean, I'm obviously wrong, but I have this nagging feeling it's circular because we, we use probably winning to define strengths. So I've lost some step of the definitions. So I'm, I'm separating the problem of coming up with an optimal mechanism for these players into two steps. One is come up with good allocation rules. Allocation rules are just monotone allocations from 
quantile to probably winning. In this step, quantiles are just whoever ends up being from the mechanism that solve, once I have these allocation constraints, I then have to solve that single player problem. That's going to tell me how to map types to quantiles. Okay? I'm trying to ask about but I'm not trying to ask about the quantiles, but who's stronger than which, and that's what I'm trying to ask about. But you should go on, because I'm honestly, I'm honestly. Just for the strongest. Is there will be a mapping from types to quantiles? The point is, I am trying to understand what this constraint means. This constraint comes from this definition, which has nothing to do with types. Nothing to do with incentives, nothing to do with types, nothing. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand this definition. Okay, so for n equals two players, with quantiles drawn uniformly from zero, one, what does strongest quantile, what does, is the allocation constraint, the interim allocation constraint that strongest quantile wins induces? It's just the probability you win is one minus q. Right? If you're quantile q, you win the probability one minus q because if you're q equals zero, you win probably one, right? It's just a line, right? That's the fraction of people who are stronger than you from that distribution. Okay? So in order to prove this lemma, I'm going to show that any symmetric feasible allocation rules y are also feasible for y hat. Okay? And therefore, because when I optimize revenue in my program for y hat, I'm allowed to choose something worse, something that was feasible for y hat, I might as well just start with y hat in the first place. So I'm going to prove this by contradiction. So suppose y is infeasible for y hat. So let's remember what feasibility means. Remember that feasibility was in terms of the cumulative allocation rules. Right? We said y was feasible if, for every quantile uh, ex ante constraint, um, the cumulative probability allocated below that is less than that given by the allocation constraint. So this just says, suppose it's infeasible, which means there exists some point where it's bigger. <coughs> Two very different notions of feasibility floating around on the same That's correct. So I have an allocation rule being feasible for an allocation constraint, and I have interim feasibility, which is, um, are, these, are they feasible for the ex post Region. Exactly. And so, and when you think about optimizing things with a, a reduction that has two parts, right? So you have this optimizing over single player problems and then optimizing single player problems. There's this optimization has to have some feasibility property. But then when it sort of makes calls to the single player problem, it's got to also satisfy some feasibility property. So this is the sort of internal feasibility property. Okay. So what is the probability? that player i has a type that's stronger than q hat. Just q hat, because quantiles are always uniform. OK? So what is the probability that one of the players, one of these two players, is a high type stronger than q hat? Well, it's 1 minus the probability that neither are, so it's this, right? which is that. OK. But how often do we allocate to one of these guys? Well, the, problem, the probability we allocate to a type stronger than q hat by this allocation rule, for, for, for consider player one, we'll probably allocate to him, right? That's just this integral of the allocation constraint. So this, integrating this, this allocation constraint, 1 minus q, I get this integral, OK? OK, I have two players. Both have to be allocated with probability at least q hat. 
Okay, so this is the probability I have to allocate one of these guys if they're a high type. Okay? And this is the probability there exists a guy. And these are equal. And that, that better be the case because remember y hat was feasible. Okay? So y hat is all good. We look at the probability these guys show up, we look at um, the probability we allocate, they're equal. But for the contradiction, we assumed that y was bigger than y hat at this q hat. Which means when I write this down, I'm going to get a violation of feasibility. I need to serve these guys with more probability than they show up. Okay? So any y, any uh, little y with cumulative allocation rule at some point which is bigger than y hat, meaning it's infeasible for y, just can't be, can't be allocated. Okay? I want to point out again that if I'm trying to solve this interim program and then try to solve these single player problems, the interim program is always solved by the same solution. The y hats are always highest quantile wins for a single item auction. Which means I'm free to only consider the single player problem and just solve it. I don't have to do some complicated optimization of allocation profiles and then optimize the single player problem. I only have to optimize the single player problem. Okay? So, in other words, that optimization, there's a sort of unique solution to the allocation constraints, which is kind of amazing and super helpful. And which is, you know, a large number of papers in the 80s and 90s used this property implicitly, not stating it this way. Yeah? Yeah, optimization problem had a sum of revenues, one for each player. So, so what is the revenue as a function of the quantile? What is that function? I don't understand your question, but I'm going to right now map this onto the public budget case where I think you might answer your question. So maybe could you ask that question again in a second if you don't know the answer? So, so let me see if I understand. I mean, it seems like the whole power of doing this change of variable, this representation in quantile space, is it allows you to view the optimal mechanism as identical even as you vary the single agent preferences. So it pushes the sort of preference dependence part just in the single agent problem. Yep. Yep. Okay, so as I was saying, the strongest quantile wins allocation constraint is independent of the single agent problem. It's always the best one to use in a symmetric environment. Um, so how do we think about that? Let's look at um, the public budget example. And in the previous talk, I said, given an allocation constraint of y hat equals 1 minus q, what is the optimal single agent mechanism? And I drew... Do I have it here? I do have it here. Great. So I took this allocation constraint and I said, what was the optimal single agent mechanism? And I said, what does it do? Well, it irons the top, it's greedy on some tiny interval, and then it reserve prices the bottom. Okay? So what is the mapping from types to quantiles that I want to use here? Well, the single player mechanism is going to say, all these top guys get the exact same quant or random quantile in interval. It doesn't matter. Okay? These guys get quantiles sort of equal to their type relative to the distribution. And these guys actually doesn't matter either because they all get price at zero. They all they're they get rejected. Okay, so the single player problem will resolve how to map types to quantiles so that the right thing happens, and I get a this curve. Okay, as I said before, almost all positive results in literature for nonlinear mechanisms, so budgets, risk aversion, are using this fact that the allocation rule I need at the beginning is just the strongest quantile wins allocation rule. Actually, you said almost all. Can you give us some examples? No. I said almost just to cover my bases. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> almost all the literature is only the symmetric case. So in the, in the nice case of out budget constraints, it's a little work in asymmetric auctions. But there's, since there's almost no work in asymmetric auctions at all, then intersect that with budget constraints or anything. Or well, I just thought he was going to give me an interesting No, point. I said almost because I knew I've, I have some economists in the audience <laughs> who might point out the one paper that didn't do this that I didn't notice. So that's why I have an almost here.
Okay, so I want to think about the asymmetric case, and um, this, uh, you know, the, the study that the economists did of uh, budgets and risk aversion actually prompted uh, Border to characterize uh, this interfeasibility constraint more generally than the symmetric case. Okay, and the, the characterization is actually literally saying the exact same thing we said before in our proof. We said, but except now I'm going to allow you to put different constraint, ex ante constraints on each type. So suppose player one is in the strongest half, the player two is in the strongest quarter, and the strongest three is the, uh, the player three is in the strongest third, right? So if you have an, uh, a quantile constraint on each player, so each player is on the top, you know, Q hat of their quantile. Okay, then this is the total you have to allocate to those players in expectation. This is the probability that one of them shows up. One or more of them shows up. Okay, so it better be that you don't allocate to them more than one of them shows up. So one direction, this is obvious. Okay, and the, the great thing that Border did was he proved that it was an if and only if. Okay, that in fact, it's a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay, I want to show you a very simple proof of, of this based on the, net, uh, the min flow max cut theorem and network flow, which will seem familiar to a lot of you. Okay, so this is a, a, a network flow graph I'm going to make. So I have a, a start and a, a source and a sink. Okay, and I'm going to put types in this graph as follows. Okay, so this column is profiles of quantiles. Imagine I've discretized quantiles. So they're profiles of quantiles. I can discreetly write this down now. So profiles of quantiles. And here I'm going to do two cases where I have high and low. Okay? And high is going to be probably half and low is going to be probably half. So I've discretized space by having high types and low types only. Okay? So I have two agents in this example. And each can have a low type or a high type. So I have four profiles of quantiles. Four quantile profiles possible. Here, I put every possible type of every agent. Okay, so player one could be low, player two, oh, two could be low, player two could be high, player two, uh, one could be high. Okay, and in this graph, I can interpret the flow that's going to happen from the start to these, these uh, quantile profiles as probability. Okay, so these are all equally likely, so this is going to be actually a quarter on each of these. Okay. And then I can interpret how the flow goes out of a node here as who wins the object. Okay, so here, uh, when I got low high here, uh, the high type won the object and the low type didn't. Okay, so the flow went this way. Okay, and then I can interpret the flow here as what was the interim probability that type got anything, because this is going to collect all of the things that it gets. Okay, so. Now I want to, so that's how I can take any mechanism I had and write it down here. I just say, what is the flow? What's it, where's it putting it? Places, sum it up, and send it from S to T. Okay, so any mechanism I can put as a flow in this graph. Okay, I want to note that this vertex is connected to two vertices over here. One for, or in general, it's going to be connected to N vertices, one for the type of each person in the profile. Okay, so it gets an L1 and an H2. Good. So I'm going to add, um, I want to use the, the uh, max flow min cut theorem, so I'm going to add capacities to this graph. The capacities on these edges are just the probabilities of getting there. The capacities out of these edges are just the same as the capacity incoming. So in other words, you can put the total, if, if your feasibility was one, right, you can put that total one out on any of these edges. Right? So if you got, uh, sorry, if you're, if you're, Incoming flow was the probability of this. You can put that total probability anywhere else. So I just um, put that flow here. That flow also goes there. Okay, and then the flow I'm going to put here on this edge is the flow that I want from the interim allocation rule that I want to see is, is if it's feasible. Okay, so that is this interim allocation probability of that thing. Okay, now I'm just asking. Does there exist a mechanism that saturates all these edges? Okay, is the maximum flow uh, cut going to be this cut of just cutting B? Okay, or is there something else here? 
And so this picture happens to be, I've, I've done this for the dictator mechanism, which I showed you before. So player one, if they're high, they get it. Otherwise, player two gets it. That was a feasible mechanism. It has this allocation rule. Player one, if they're high, always gets it. Okay? Player two, this is player two's low and high. They get probably a half each. And player one, if it's low, never gets it. Here is the double dictator mechanism. Okay. Where what I've done is I've drawn here at uh, these edges are the capacities now, not flows. These are the capacities that you have to put on the edges for the double dictator mechanism. Okay. So double dictator serves both high one and high two with certainty if they show up. And it shows neither of them if they, uh, the low types don't get served, right, of the double dictator. And so then you say, well, is min flow equal to max cut? And in fact, no. This has two edges going across it. These are uh, one and one, which is two. And here I had only three edges of capacity a quarter each crossing them. Okay. Sorry, these were a half each, so it was total one. And these were a quarter each, so I have three quarters crossing this cut. and uh, one crossing this cut, and so min flow is not equal to max cut. Okay, um, so uh, in the paper we have on this, we generalize this, uh, this border condition to matroids, where the generalization is that you write the expected rank of the matroid, basically if you randomly draw quantiles according to the probabilities of the quantile profile. Um, I want to point out of interest to some people here that um, in 2005, uh, in particular, uh, Amos uh, and Nicole and some others were studying derandomization of auctions. And we came up with basically the exact same flow graph construction to turn randomized auctions into deterministic auctions. In other words, we wanted to take an auction where here we might split the flow, right? Instead, you want to come up with an integral version of the flow, where it only goes to one place. It's a very similar construction in that paper. OK, the next thing on my list, so I've shown you the characterization of interim feasibility. Um, the theorem that you can then say, well, what kind of ex post mechanisms do you have to look at to be able to implement all interim feasible mechanisms? And the answer is stochastic weighted optimizers. And a stochastic weighted optimizer is the following. You take any function you want that randomly max maps types to weights, and then you maximize the weighted sum of types uh, subject to feasibility. So this will give you everything. I'm going to skip my discussion of this. I think uh, Costas will talk about it briefly. Um, and I'm going to skip my discussion of this also because I want to talk about the next part of my talk. Um, <clears throat> the MS. <laughs> hey, um, I'm happy to talk about uh, this construction uh, before. In particular, um, actually, I think I want to show you this picture. This is a picture, a pictorial representation of ex post versus interim feasibility. So this is ex post feasibility. If these types show up, you can only serve them. You can't serve this guy who didn't show up. And then you have this feasibility constraint. Okay, if this guy didn't show up, you can't serve them. So you can only serve some such types that do show up. And now if you look at what interim feasibility means, it's some combination of these polytopes that looks like this, in fact. I don't want to go into more detail. But I can explain this picture to you offline if you want to see more of it. Okay, I was going to talk about public budgets, but I also don't have time. So I want to talk about this um, unit demand single agent problem. Okay, so again, the example you should have in your mind here is uniform 0, 1 squared. And I want to prove the thing that I said I was going to prove at the very beginning of this talk, which is that projecting this multidimensional type to a single dimension is optimal. Okay, this comes from a, a paper joint with Nima Hagpana, who's here for the semester. And this is something that he's been working on since 2011. And, um, you know, it takes you a while to get the right answer. 
and it's, it's the right answer now. I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Um, it's very closely related to a bunch of recent interests in computer science in uh, solving multiplayer problems in Bayesian settings, and so here are some papers. Um, and it's also very closely related to some classic work, um, in particular, most reliant on Armstrong and Roche and Chenet. Okay, so what were my unit demand preferences? Again, uh, if you had M items, you can have an allocation, which is the simplex. So it's a probability you get each item, okay, with a sum of probabilities at most one, and a payment. Players have private types, indexing how much they like each item, uh, and the type space I'll denote by capital T, uh, which I'll just restrict to zero, one arbitrarily. Okay, the utility is the dot product of type and allocation minus the payment. Okay, I'm gonna draw types from a distribution with density function little f of t. So think of two examples which we'll be talking about today. One is the single dimensional case which we know and love, m equals one. Okay, the other is my two dimensional case where let's think about the uniform zero one case. Yeah. You didn't do much, but it does look like additive, but if I have this constraint that I can only serve one of the items, it's the same as unit demand. This constraint says you can only get at most one of the items. You're getting a, we're, we're allocating one thing to you, right? Because the allocation is the probability simplex on which item you get. Yeah, but x, x can be a half say. X can... That's the point. So the point is once I've constrained allocation to only give you one thing, then someone with additive preferences over things is the same as someone with unit demand preferences over things because they can only get one thing anyway. So that unit demand constraint is not binding. That was Nikhil's question. For anyone else, don't worry about that. Um, I'm gonna, for all of this talk, constrain myself to item symmetric distributions like this, okay? In an item symmetric distribution, the optimal solution is always symmetric. Therefore, I can restrict myself to solving it only on the portion of the type space where the T1 is bigger, uh, the type for the item one is bigger than the type for every other item. Okay, so for the unit demand uh, problem, I'm restricting type space to this, this part. Okay, and if it was item symmetric distribution, if I solve the problem here, then I can just put that together with the symmetric opposite and I get the general solution. This is just as a notational convenience for me right now because I just want to just always refer to one as being the highest type, the favorite item type. So there are multiple bidders? No, again, I'm solving the single item, single agent problem. Okay, and the, the stuff I talked about yesterday for solving the single agent problem for revenue linear players will solve the multiplayer problem. Okay, so uh, I wanna consider some motivation for the result I'm gonna give. So I'm gonna tell you that under some large family of distributions, we can collapse the multi-dimensional preference for different colors of this car to a single dimensional preference the guy has for his favorite color car. Okay? So what's the intuition? So if you were thinking about price discrimination, you think, huh, I have this car, I could paint it red or blue, maybe I can get more money by discriminating because players have different values, different colors. And the idea of price discrimination is that price discrimination can improve revenue if high value agents are more sensitive to the different outcomes you're producing, in this case colors, than low value agents. Okay, so they're willing to pay a premium to specify exactly what they want. And the low guys, you can give them maybe a random thing. Okay, so you'd offer a high price to choose your color and a low price for a random color. This is what you would want to do if high types were more sensitive to color than low types. So today, I'm going to try to understand the situations when that's not true. There's no mileage from price discrimination. Uh, in other words, I want to understand what this condition, which I've written informally here, high value agents are less sensitive to color, what that means. And so I'm going to give you a mathematical statement for this uh, actually shortly, okay? This means the intuition is then price discrimination will be unhelpful 
is going to be without loss to project this multi-dimensional type into a single dimensional type. And having done so, your optimal mechanism is just a single dimensional theory. Okay, so you could either use this, um, the reduction I gave you yesterday for ex ante pricing, or you could just say, well, we know what, how to solve the single dimensional problem, let's just do it. Okay, so you write the single dimensional virtual value and you solve it, and you're done. So I want to tell you what this high value agents are less sensitive to color means. Okay, and so I want to look at the distribution. So remember, your T1 is your value for your favorite item. So I want to look at the distribution of your value, uh, the ratio of value for your favorite item and second uh, highest item, conditioned on your value for your favorite item. Okay, so if I tell you your favorite item, there's a distribution that tells you what your second favorite item is drawn from, okay? What's the conditional distribution of the ratio to your favorite item? That's the object I'm talking about here. And then if I think about this distribution and change your value for the favorite item, that distribution changes if you change this, right? So if this is ordered by first order stochastic dominance, then uh, high value agents are less sensitive to color than low value agents. You never want to price discriminate. So I want to draw a picture. Okay, so high value agents are less sensitive. So if you think about density, the, in other words, uh, let's draw this picture. So say this is probably, I'm going to look at, uh, one, one way to get a handle on this is, let's ask for any type T, what's the probability that your second uh, value is less than half your first value? The, the intuition here is that densities are getting higher, like this way. Okay, so your mass is getting pushed upward. Okay, I want to do a warm up, which is uh, this. In fact, I'm going to completely solve the uniform zero one case before I show how to generalize this to more uh, dimensions. Okay, and that approach comes from Armstrong, which says, Let's just uh, look at the problem conditioned to rays coming out of the origin. So we condition on the types lying on some ray out of the origin. Solve the problem optimally on that type space, the conditional type space. And then hope that the conditions are, are consistent. Okay, so Let's denote the conditional distribution of the, your favorite item to be F max. Okay, and you can figure out what that is. So uh, again, I said I want to condition on the ratio between the two types. And assume that the seller knows what this ratio is. So the seller knows the types lie on this space. Now I want to solve that multidimensional optimal mechanism problem. Okay, I want to note that Okay, if I tell you that, then I might care about what your distribution of, your, of, of T1 is. Well, that's just the same as the distribution of F max. So conditioned on this knowledge of, of theta, you have the same distribution F max for your favorite item. Okay, the following two problems are the same problem. This stochastic, this probabilistic problem, where your value is T1, and I can allocate with probably 1, or I could allocate it with probably theta, or 0. Sorry, this, the, the following stochastic problem, or this two item problem, where your value is T1 for item 1, and your value is always theta T1 for item 2. In other words, item 2 is the exact same thing as item 1 with some probability. Okay? So these two problems are identical, and we know how to solve this problem. If I have a single item and your value is T1, and you can allocate with certainty with some probability or 0, then we know you never want to allocate with probability 0. Uh, probability theta. It's always certainty or zero. Why? You want to maximize virtual surplus. So you want to serve the types always that have positive virtual value and serve them never if they have negative virtual value, which corresponds to posting the price that inverts the virtual value function, which for this distribution is square root one third. Okay. 
This is actually a combination of a bunch of results in the literature referred to as no haggling. You don't want to post probabilities. Okay, so these two problems are isomorphic. And then I want to note that I told the seller theta and said, use this knowledge of the guy's type I'm telling you to find an optimal mechanism. The guy did, it didn't depend on theta. Which means the same mechanism is optimal without knowledge of theta. So if, if for theta, I want to post this price, that means for every ray out of the origin, I want to post this price. So now I've solved the problem in this half. We have the symmetric solution in the top half, which is this. And so now we see we post a price square at one third. Okay. That is the fastest argument of a multidimensional optimal mechanism that I know of. Okay. There are two challenges to generalizing this to general types. And one is, if you want to generalize to general types, you need to consider paths that are not rays out of the origin. Okay. Now, the problem is there are a lot of paths out of the origin that you could potentially choose from to cover type space. Okay. Which path do you choose? So that selection problem has prevented a lot of multidimensional microline line from proceeding. We're going to give a solution to resolving that problem. You mean what's the analog of choosing the ratio? Yeah, so here we're looking at rays out of the origin. We're looking at conditioning on types with a theta, which is just a line out of the origin. So you can imagine conditioning on some other path, right? What would be the path you'd want to condition on? One way to think about that is no matter what you condition, the distribution stays the same. That's another way to think about that. Okay? Um, but then you have to solve the mechanism line on not a straight line. Okay, and if you're solving, if I condition onto some path, right, I don't have the simple property that your value for the other item is just a linear fraction value for the first item. It's only on rays. So the simple solution we had here is not going to apply to general paths. So we have to address two things. The most important one is the first one. I want to focus on that. You wrap up in about five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want you to remember that when you're optimizing revenue, there isn't a point-wise optimal mechanism. There's not some mechanism that for every input gives you the best revenue possible on that input. Okay, so you have to re maximize revenue and expectation for the distribution of types. Okay, so I want to give you the following definition. And I want to explain it to you. And this definition, I want you to think analogously to Tim's definition of smoothness. So this is a definition that if I can get it to do interesting things, and, uh, then it's an interesting definition. Okay? So I'm going to call a, a function, which is a, we'll call a candidate virtual value function, okay? which maps types to real numbers. So it's going to be a, a multidimensional virtual value, if it, if it is one. Um, the following. So it's an amortization of revenue if. Virtual surplus is equal to revenue and expectation, meaning expected virtual surplus equals expected payment. Okay? For any ICIR mechanism you choose, it always amortizes revenue. Okay? I'm going to call this function incentive compatible if the virtual surplus maximizer, meaning the X where you always choose to give the player the thing that maximizes his virtual value function. If that x is incentive compatible, meaning, what does it mean for x to be incentive compatible? Uh, there exists a p such that xp is ic. Right? Okay, I'm going to call it a virtual value if both a and b hold. Meaning, for all mechanisms, this thing will account for revenue. And if I optimize this function pointwise, the result I get is incentive compatible. Okay? And here's the simple proposition that you can have if this definition is true. Okay? If a virtual value exists, then the virtual value surplus maximizer is optimal. Okay? And that proof is simple. So let x be the virtual surplus maximizer. We know that its revenue is equal to its virtual surplus. It maximizes virtual surplus amongst all mechanisms, so it's better than any other x. And that x is equal to the, ver the revenue of the other mechanism. Okay. 
And the great thing about this is we took this challenge where there was no point-wise optimal mechanism for revenue. And if you can find a virtual surplus, a virtual value function, then you get a point-wise optimization you can solve. Okay, so again, analogous to smoothness, but the really nice thing about smoothness is you can analyze sort of a point argument about some input, and it holds for like distributions over stuff and all this other stuff that you don't have to analyze. So it's actually serving a very similar purpose to, to that definition. Okay, so I'm going to skip the single dimensional linear discussion and talk about m equals 2. Okay, so here is in one slide how you need to think about multi dimensional mechanism design to find virtual value functions. So Roche characterized any incentive file mechanism as inducing a utility function that was convex, and you can always pinpoint the allocation rule of that mechanism as the gradient of the utility function. Okay, then in a, in a later paper, he showed you how you can view this to come up with a amortization of revenue. Okay, um, you just write revenue as surplus minus utility, surplus minus utility, and then you integrate by parcel and pass to write this utility in terms of gradients of utility. Okay, and then if you do that right, you can factor out the gradient of utility and just get a payment in terms of allocation. Again, um, for two dimensions, there's a degree of freedom in picking paths. For one dimension, there's no degree of freedom. You have to go up pass downward. For two dimensions, there's a degree of freedom. Okay? And so that degree of freedom is going to give you a lot of possible amortizations, and most of them, all except for one, are not going to be incentive compatible, and only maybe one. All except for maybe one are not going to be incentive compatible. So how do you find the right one? And so the main idea from this paper with, uh, with NEMA, which lets you uh, find multidimensional virtual values, is an idea for reverse engineering virtual values. In other words, I want to reduce this degree of freedom I have. Okay, so I'm going to guess the form of the optimal mechanism and use that guess to reduce the degree of freedom from choosing paths. Okay, so if I'll call a mechanism a, a, a favorite item projection, as I said before, if it always allocates as if it projects first and then runs the a mechanism first, the favorite item projection. Okay, if a favorite item projection is optimal, then it better be your your multi-dimensional virtual value for your favorite item is equal to the virtual value of the favorite item projection. So now one of my virtual values in my two-dimensional virtual value is known. It's the favorite item virtual value. I can use that virtual value and the differential equation I get from this integration by parts to solve for the other one. Now I've identified one virtual value function. Um, and all I have to do is identify sufficient conditions that my initial guess is correct. So I need to guess that maximizing virtual surplus indeed gives me this projection. Okay? Which means if this if the virtual value is positive for the favorite item, it better be bigger than your virtual value for your other item. That virtual value for your other item comes out of the differential equations I get by starting here and going through the differential equations from Roche. And if they're both ne if if the if the favorite item is negative, it better both be negative. So I don't allocate at all. Hey, if that's true, it's optimal. And then uh, the conditions I gave on the on the previous in the first slide are exactly the conditions you need to, to check out that this is true. Okay. So to conclude, um, I've shown you a lot of aspects in which multidimensional and nonlinear mechanism design theory can mirror what we understand and work with in the single dimensional space. There's a lot of value in taking that perspective, in part because uh, a lot of results will automatically extend, and there's a lot known about that, the, the, the tools you work with in, the, in those settings. So in particular, I gave you a couple multi-single agent reductions. Um, we talked about marginal revenue, which is a very useful economic intuition about how uh, optimal auctions work. Um, and I showed you how to derive multidimensional virtual values which is the, the workhorse of all of single dimensional auction theory, and there have been lots of extensions using virtual values. And the hope we have for this theory of virtual values we developed for multidimensional settings is one, you'll be able to use virtual values for more kinds of problems than just showing the favorite item projection is optimal. 
and two, that uh, that these virtual value that this kind of virtual values will enable have similarly enable a theory for multi-dimensional preferences like that we've had for single-dimensional preferences. All right, thank you. <laughs>